Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. It's, it's a blessing. It's been a while, several weeks I was told, uh, ten in fact, I guess. Uh, so, so glad to be together though. Um, wow. Is this you, Connor? Thanks. It was awesome. Alrighty, so <clears throat> the last two weeks we've been dealing with uh, the purpose of the final judgment. You know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10 that, that we must all, every one of us, stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That each one may receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad. So we've been talking about the purpose of the final day of judgment. And you may be thinking, well, the purpose isn't that to determine who's lost and who's saved. This may come as a surprise to many of you, but I can say it's definitely not to determine who's lost and who's saved. And the reason that we can say that is because God is all-knowing. Doesn't God know who's lost and who's saved? And not only that, after we die, whether you think that we go to heaven or to hell, or whether you think that we go to intermediate state, you know, paradise, and to the lost that they go to uh, torments in Hades, will we not already know? So it's not to determine who's lost and who's saved. One of the purposes of the final day of judgment, well, first of all, God's going to, He's going to reveal all of our deeds. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 14 there, we see that the Bible says that God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So God is going to bring every work into judgment. We see in Luke chapter 12 and verse 2, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Guess what, brethren? It's all going to be laid out there. And, and you know what? It's going to vindicate God. God will be vindicated. And when we say vindicated, this is what we mean. It's, it's clearing someone of blame or for wrongdoing. When God says to this or to that person, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. God will have just revealed, exposed all their deeds. God will be vindicated. You know, those who are there who may, you know, I don't know, this probably isn't going to happen, but I'm just saying, could you just imagine those saying, how's come, how's come he he's, gets to enter heaven, but I don't? Well, your deeds speak for themselves. So the vindication of God, God will be vindicated by each person's deeds, but also the, the glory of God. Now, when you think about it, let's just think about this court, courtroom setting here. I mean, that's the imagery that comes to mind. It's like all the evidence is laid out there against you. It's overwhelming. Your guilt as a lawbreaker is overwhelming. And God says, depart from you who practice lawlessness. Isn't God glorified in his justice? If we were in a courtroom and the evidence was overwhelming against someone and a, and a, and a judge said, you know what, you're sentenced to da-da-da-da. Would we not say, well, justice was served? But at the same time, or on the other hand, I should say, as God lays out there uh, the Christian's deeds, good and bad, and God says, enter in, you blessed of my Father. Would we not say that God is glorified in His grace? That really, that sinner doesn't deserve heaven, but God in His grace bestows it upon them. And so God will be glorified in His grace. And then the last one we talked about last week was it's evidence of faith. Let me thinking, I'm saved by grace based upon my faith, but yet I'm judged by my works. Ephesians 2 and verse 8 says that we're justified by grace through faith. But brethren, you see that the faith that justifies is a faith that works. And don't we see that in James? You see that a man is justified by works, not by faith only? He even makes the point that people will argue, listen, well, some have works and some have, or some have faith and some have works. And what does James say, like as a rebuttal? He says, listen, you show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works, right? Works are just the inevitable expression 
of faith. Ne necessary evidence of faith. Lastly, the exaltation of Christ. That's what we're going to cover this morning. On the day of judgment, Christ will be exalted as the glorious and majestic king that he is. Now this one's last, but it sure, certainly is not least, brethren. Now as we think about Christ being exalted as the glorious and majestic king that he is, I want us to just look at in some detail three things. If you're a note taker, you may want to write these three things down. First of all, we're going to look at the idea, the meaning of the word kingdom. Secondly, we're going to look at God's purpose for the world. And third and lastly, we're going to consider kingship as we see it throughout the Bible. It's something we see from the beginning to the end, kingship. So we're going to talk about kingdom, God's purpose for the world. And we're going to talk about kingship, okay? Let's consider kingdom. Kingdom. The meaning of kingdom, really, it can be used in two different ways. It's a realm or region over which a king reigns. Well, many of you have uh, maps in, in the back of your Bible, if you were to open up there during the United Kingdom. You would see that during Saul's reign, that Saul reigned over a certain region in Palestine. And then David comes along, and the borders of his kingdom are spread. You know, they expound, they're spread, and even more so in Solomon. We use kingdom in a sense over a region or realm over which a king reigns. But then we also use the word kingdom to talk about the king's reign, his status of kingship, the idea of honor and glory and dominion, lordship, kingship, right? Right? We use it in terms of the realm over which he reigns and in also just his reign as such, right? Now, think about this for a second. When Meph Meph Mephibosheth, in 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 6, whenever he comes to David, guess what? He bows down to David in order to honor him. Why? Because he was king. He was in an exalted position in Mephibosheth. Recognize that. How many times have you seen a movie where, you know, a subject, a vassal, you know, of a king would come and say, or bow down and say, your highness, right? What's he acknowledging? Just the high and lofty status of the king, right? Secondly, God's purpose for the world. For what purpose did God create? So I know I've mentioned this before, but I hope that it is not like drifting from your memory bank and you have to be reminded. But if you do need to be reminded, write it down, bring it into your heart, tuck it away in your memory bank. For what purpose did God create? I mean, doesn't creating something imply purpose? Just recently, I made a Lego table. I didn't make it from scratch. I actually took a, a used table and made it into a Lego table. What do you think the purpose of that was for? For it to be used, to be played with, to hold Legos. For my boys to be able to build things on the base plates, right? And I, I saw to it that it was used that way. If I make gobs, you know, whoopie pies, also known as whoopie pies, guess what the purpose of making those things are for? Eating them and savoring the flavor, right? So for what purpose did God create? God created to manifest his glory in and among his creatures on the one hand. And on the other hand, is for his creatures to glorify Him as King. How do you glorify God? How do we glorify God? You make God the King of your life. 
That's how you glorify God. If you say God is your Lord, but you do not do the things that He says, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. The person who does the will of the Father who is in heaven is the person who makes God their king. And so how do you glorify God? You make God your king, and then you also bring others to acknowledge his kingship. That's the purpose for which God had created However, we also notice, though, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28, that God, even though He has absolute uh, lordship, kingship over the world, He has delegated authority to man whom He has created. And the reason being is because He made man His image. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, the Bible says, For let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And what's He go on to say in verse 28? And let them have dominion. Over all the earth. He goes on to talk about beasts of the field and birds of the air and fish of the sea and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Man is to have dominion, but it's delegated. He doesn't have absolute dominion, God does. Man is just a vassal. Of the King of Kings. The one and only true God. The Lord of Lords. The one of a kind. Deity. You know, we think about the fall of of man. We see here that that God's plan and purpose again was His kingship over creation and man's, man's free. I mean, man has free will, right? I mean, you remember whenever Adam and Eve were in a garden, God God said, you shall eat of all the trees in the midst of the garden, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat eat of it. For the day in which you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, even though man was delegated authority and is in a position you know, where he's superior over the rest of the created world, he still was to be subject to the king. And he was to recognize God as the king. And he was to be faithful, yet free, yet faithful. Well, guess what? Man didn't really like that arrangement, did he? From the time of Adam, from every man since... Man has rejected that arrangement. Man has refused to confess and to acknowledge the sovereignty or the supremacy of the king. In a desire to have independence from authority, to be like God, you know Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5, what does Satan say? For God knows the day that you eat of it, you'll be like God. Was that an appeal? Did Adam and Eve, did they desire to to sort of be like God? They wanted to have that independence, that that freedom from authority. And so they took of the fruit and they ate. We all have taken of the fruit and ate, by the way. We all have refused at some point in our lifetime to confess and to acknowledge the sovereignty of God. Here's the thing, though. Man and his desire to be free from authority, to have independence, has actually become a bondservant of sin, a slave, a slave to death, and a vassal to the usurper, Satan. What's the Bible refer to Satan as? Is he not the God of this age or the prince of this age? Man has become enslaved to the usurper. You know, some a usurper is someone who seeks to take the throne of someone else. He's seeking to take God's throne. And so that's what we have, the fall. But what about redemption? Remember, we're working through, we're talking about kingship from the beginning to the end. From creation, people, man, human beings were to respect 
and honor God for the king that he is, to acknowledge him as king and to confess and to submit to him as sovereign Lord. We have all rebelled against the sovereignty of God, become slaves to sin, Satan, and death, and then you have redemption, right? God had determined from the foundation of the world, brethren, from eternity, that his purpose for creation, what did we say the purpose for creation was? Why did God create? To manifest his glory in and among his creatures and for his creatures to glorify him in return, right? God had determined from the foundation of the world that his creation purposes would be worked out through redemption in Jesus Christ. What do you think about the redemptive work of Jesus Christ? There's a few reasons or things that are accomplished by the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. For one is to make atonement for man who has sinned against the sovereignty of God. Atonement. At-one-ment. To make us at one with God because we have rebelled against the sovereignty of God. Also, to, to, to give a crushing blow to the usurpers. Sin, death, and Satan. Also, to reestablish his lordship through the resurrection from the dead. And lastly, is to make a way for sinners to be restored in their original purpose with the sovereign God in free acknowledgement of his sovereignty. I want you to go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We're going to look at Romans chapter 1. We're going to look at Acts chapter 2. Okay, Romans chapter 1. For the sake of time, I don't have time to go to all the verses that I reference um, along the way. But I, I do want to look at Romans chapter 1, verse 4. Uh, go back, actually, to verse 3. So Paul's wanting to go to Rome. He's wanting to preach the gospel to them. He doesn't know whether or not, you know, he doesn't know definitively whether or not he's going to make it to Rome. And so he's going to write this letter just in case, and he's going to expound on things if he gets there. I think that's his point here. But look what he says here in verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. There's the humanity of Jesus. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. What? Declared or appointed. Some translations say appointed or maybe ordained. It doesn't mean that he went from not being divine to being divine. Okay? But I think the point is, is he went from being... Uh, well, he was divine from beginning to end. But the point is, is, as he was in heaven, he humbled himself and came to earth. He was obedient to the point of death. That's the humiliation part. Then you have the exalted part. And the exalted part begins at the resurrection. And he's appointed with power. He has assumed a special place as the crucified and resurrected Son of God, right, with power. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, he says to the Jews in Acts chapter 2, Peter does, both Lord and Christ. And what does Jesus say after his resurrection, before his ascension in Matthew 28 and verse 18? That all authority has been given to me under heaven and on the earth. I guess we don't need to go to Acts chapter 2. God has made this Jesus whom you, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. We see the exalted position of Christ. Here's the thing, though. Jesus came to his own, and his own did not receive him. John 1 and verse 11. You understand that? Whenever we think of Jesus the Christ, 
We're talking about Him as the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of God, who would save the world from their sins. He comes into His own, to His own people, and His own did not receive Him. The King of the Jews. They nailed to a Roman cross. Their King. If you were to actually look at Luke chapter 19, verses 11 and following, talking about the parable of the ten pounds, it says they, they hated their king. They rejected, he will not rule over us, they said. We think, wow, I can't believe they, they crucified the Son of God. How could they have done that? You. And me had a part in nailing Jesus to the cross. Because of our sins. Don't we say Jesus, he, he bore our sins at Calvary. We all played that part. The consummation. Of his kingship. You know there are two groups. Right now. Those who freely acknowledge his kingship. And those who don't. Those who freely acknowledge the kingship of Christ. Is the church. We have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. We have been restored in our original purpose for creation, which is to glorify God. If you are a faithful Christian, then guess what? You have made God king of your life. There's the one group. The second group is those who will not acknowledge the kingship of Christ. And because they will not acknowledge, even if they acknowledge it, there are some who will not submit. Even among the rulers, many believed. Right? But they would not confess him, lest they be put out of the synagogue. There are people who t today who believe that Jesus is Christ, yet they will not submit. Guess what, brethren? Go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And I want us to notice here, we're talking about the purpose of the final judgment. It's the exaltation of Christ. Christ will be exalted for the glorious and majestic King that He is. During Jesus' lifetime, was He exalted in the minds and hearts of the people for the king that he is. For today, y'all, crucify him. Crucify him, for he is to blame. Unfortunately, people every day continue to reject Christ. But even though that may be the case now, it won't be on a day of judgment. I want you to read with me. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, verse 5, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. There's the humiliation. The incarnation, humiliation, now the exaltation of Jesus. It starts in verse 9. Therefore, because of what Jesus has done, his submission and his redemptive work, therefore, God has made, or God also has highly exalted him, giving him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth. 
and of those under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. You see, brethren, there may be two groups now, but on a day of judgment, there'll be one group then. Every knee shall bow to Jesus Christ. You know what that signifies? Worship. They're going to worship Him for the King that He is. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Christ. For those who have freely acknowledged and submitted to His kingship in this life, they will freely do it and out of love confess and submit to His kingship then. But to those who rejected and failed to acknowledge His kingship in the here and the now will through fear. I think it's both aspects of fear. In awe and dread terror. Bow the knee and confess Jesus again as the glorious and majestic King that He is. I said this is the last one we would talk about and you can see why it's certainly not least. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love You and we're so thankful, Father, for this time to be together. We've longed for this time. We love you, Father, and we love to be in one another's presence. We're thankful, Father, for Jesus. I mean, what can we say? We realize, Father, that we don't deserve heaven. But we're humbled by Jesus' love for us. And we pray that every day of our lives, Father, that we would, in fact, keep him enthroned on the throne of our heart. And that we'd live a life that is consistent with the king that he is. That we would freely acknowledge and confess him and submit to His kingship. Help us to do that, Father. Help us to realize those areas of our lives where we don't. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I said, how do you glorify God? How do you glorify God? You make Him the king of your life. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. The kingdom there is, is that. He's first of all. Again, He sets on the throne of your heart. We talk about a throne in our heart and, and God setting on it. That's making Him Lord. That's making Him King. If you're a Christian, maybe you've not done it. I, I said, well, Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 21, just because you say, Lord, Lord, does, doesn't mean you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Neither does it mean that I'm actually your Lord. What means that I'm actually your Lord is when uh, I'm first in your life. That you live for me. If you're a Christian, maybe, maybe you've fallen away. Maybe you've gotten entangled into things. Or maybe the virus and just the, just the struggles that come with it, the depression, has caused you to depart from your king. Come back. Thankfully, we don't have a king that will say, off with your head. But he's faithful and righteous to forgive you of your sin, to cleanse you of all your unrighteousness. If you're not a Christian, you need to realize on a day of judgment, you're going to confess and bow then when you had an opportunity to do it now. If you're not a Christian, make things right with the king. Because on that day, it's going to be everlasting and too late. If you need to respond to the invitation, why don't you come forward as we stand and sing?